So Dr. Pero, as an OBGYN, I'd love to get your thoughts. If someone is thinking about getting pregnant within the next year, what would your advice be to them? Great question. So, you know, surprisingly, not all, all women see an OBGYN on a regular basis. So first things first, figure out who you're going to have as your provider. And that may also include a midwife, right? I think we're in this place in our society where more options are open for where to deliver and who and who to deliver with. And I think it's a great thing. Um, so which one is right for you, you know, an OBGYN or a midwife? Um, and where do you go to even start to look for these? Of course, you know, I personally think Google is a great source, Google reviews, but a lot of times for especially OBGYNs, I feel like you're either going to get a five star, you know, she saved my life, or you're going to get a one star, they didn't answer my phone call after 20 20 minutes, you know, yeah. holding. So you have to take those with a grain of salt. But your girlfriends, great sources for, you know, real experiences and and getting that information from them. So find find a provider. And then when you make your appointments, you know, and even make an appointment with a few different providers just to gauge, you know, your vibe and how well you sync with them. Um, but important questions to talk to them about is that, I mean, one, the majority of women that are planning on becoming pregnant will already be on a birth control method, right? When should I stop my birth control method? If I'm on other prescription medications, you know, do I just come off of them when I stop the medications or should I stop those sooner? A very classic one is spironolactone, um, which is used for acne and to help reduce testosterone levels for polycystic ovary syndrome patients. And really, you want to be off of that medication three months prior to when you start trying for pregnancy because it is a teratogen. It can cause birth defects. So uh, getting your family history, super important. You know, do you have a family history of chromosome abnormalities or, you know, any, um, you know, cystic fibrosis, for example, one in 40 Caucasians are carriers for cystic fibrosis. And, um, you know, I, I've had that experience of having a patient who was diagnosed with, uh, with having a child with cystic fibrosis mid- Mid pregnancy, so 20 weeks anatomy scan, saw some soft markers, had genetic testing done, and it was a child affected by cystic fibrosis. Of course, it's not a lethal anomaly, but you know, I, I don't know if you guys know anyone that has a child that is affected by cystic fibrosis, but you know, lifelong respiratory infections that are serious hospitalizations, you know, every year, if not two or three years, and their total lifespan is reduced. So if on the front end, you know that, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, I have had that family history, or, you know, I don't know if I have it, because some families just don't talk about their family history, then there are tools. There's actually genetic testing that you could have done mm -hmm. prior to conception to see if you're a carrier. And then, you know, I get from many patients, well, what do I do with that information if I'm a carrier? I feel like I'd be more stressed now. Um, well, with insurance companies covering a lot of fertility treatments, IVF can negate that risk when you do pre-implantation genetic testing. So that's huge. So, um, and then of course, you know, everything that, that you guys believe in and know to be true for optimizing your fertility with nutrition and supplementation and reducing your toxic exposure in the products and the environmental toxins that we get exposed to on a daily basis. So... How about when it comes to taking a prenatal? Because I think a lot of people don't actually start taking a prenatal until the moment they find out that they're pregnant, but is the advice to take it, I've heard six months, maybe even more, or what do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, the sooner that I can get someone on at least a, a B complex, you know, that has mm -hmm. folate, that, and, and, and choline as well, you know, choline is one of those ones that's so under, Patients are so undereducated about, it, and it's just as important as folate for neural development. Um, so, if the sooner the better, for sure. But we know that for all things, when we talk to patients about optimizing their fertility, if they've if they've got you know issues with infertility, we give them a three month window. We say, look, you know, I mean, your your eggs 
really that, that timeline that they recycle and turn over is three months. So we want at least three months for that. Got it. So I had my first baby when I was 34. I'll probably not have my second baby until maybe 37, 38. And I feel like a lot of women are opting to have kids later because of career or school or whatever it is. But there's still a lot of terms like geriatric pregnancy oh and all of this stuff that makes you feel like, holy crap, am I super old? Are my eggs old? What's going on? So what are some myths around getting pregnant after 35? And is there advice specific for these women? I love that. And as as a geriatric pregnancy woman, I I do not... I do not subscribe to that narrative. Um, so much of what we learn about and teach patients about, especially the functional approach, is you are not your genes. You are not, you know, your environment. You have so much control over the things that we've been taught. You have no control over. And when it comes to, you know, I've never written geriatric pregnancy on a patient's chart, but for coding, <laughs> for billing coding, there it's it's elderly. Uh, which is just, it's just as bad. It's so dumb. Like you're 35 or 38, you're not old. Um, but we've, you know, age 35 is when previous studies showed that a risk reduction would happen if women that were less than 35 were not offered in amniocentesis, which back then was very high risk to do and came with the risk of miscarriage, pregnancy loss. So they had that cutoff where, okay, 35, the the risk reduction would be better if we did it on these higher risk patients. Um, and now we're starting to find that so much of your, your egg quality even, so not just the quantity that we worry about as we get older, but the egg quality is dependent on not just your age, but so much of our environmental mm-hmm. toxin exposure and epigenetics, that word that I'm so glad that's becoming uh, more mainstream for people to understand that uh, you can do a lot to turn on and off certain genes. And so for my patients, when they come in and they're 35 and they're worried because they've heard all of this um, from their girlfriends and social media, you know, I tell them the statistics. You literally have a 1% chance of having a child with chromosome abnormalities, okay? That's at age 35. At age 38, it's a 2% chance, okay? Now that's not, that's, in addition to every woman's baseline risk of having a three to five percent chance of having a child with a birth defect, which is different, okay? So cleft lip or pilot, uh, structural heart defects, those are birth defects. Chromosomal, ab- chromosomal abnormalities are like your trisomies, like Down syndrome. And so, you know, just hearing that, that okay, two percent chance, that's, that's it at age 38. That's great, you know. Um, and then if they've got family history, if they've got things that potentially could increase that percentage, then talking to them about ways that we can we can reduce that. But absolutely, I think that uh, I've always said I'd rather a 38 year old you coming into my office than a 21 year old who eats McDonald's all day and doesn't know how to do a lunge, you know? So I think it's, it's very relative and it's starting to come around that that is just something, a huge myth that we need to debunk. Yeah. So it's interesting because I've been seeing a lot of women who are maybe 25, maybe 30, and they are like, well, I'm starting to see somebody. I don't know where it's going, or I just don't know when marriage is going to happen or a partner is going to happen and they're freezing their eggs or they're like kind of going into the situation feeling like I'm probably going to have trouble getting pregnant. I feel like that's been a lot more common. Right. So what is your advice to somebody who's maybe feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm in my late twenties, early thirties, and I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to yeah. freeze my eggs. Do you feel like that's the, the, do you feel like that's a good thing to do? I or? think if you have, I'm always ready to meet patients and clients where they are in their journey. And I think that if you have access to that, if you work for, you know, a, a Google or an Apple and they're paying for that, and and you know that at this point in your life, you know, 
nutrition is not going to change. Uh, you're, you're, you're vaping and that's your only form of stress reduction and that's not going to change. You know, if, if it makes sense for you to not know really where your timeline is going to be in the next five to 10 years, and if you're still going to be doing those unhealthy habits that will reduce your ovarian reserve and the quality and quantity of your eggs, then go for it, okay? But if if I'm sitting down with a patient and I'm, and I'm educating them, I'm saying this is what you can do to at the points in time where you get to improve your egg quality and your egg quantity that's mm-hmm. been evidence-based um, and has clear research behind it, then that gives them potentially a lot of empowerment to say, I, I don't have to go this, you know, really, it's it's not it's not a procedure that's, easy to do. It's not, it's, it's a, it's a process, you know, and you're putting your body through a lot of hormones. So I think that really, really having that informed decision making for patients and knowing that there's other options that they can do is huge. Absolutely. I love this. I know, Dr. Perra, when I saw you, we were having hours of this conversation, you know, I'm Gosh, I always forget how old I am. I guess I'm turning 35 this year. I'm in the second year of my marriage. You know, my friends are having like their second kid right now. And I always question, so I'm like, I have a lot of people in, you know, the world that we're in in functional medicine who are older, having healthy kids. And that's the world I see. But I've, I have other friends who are maybe in more conventional medicine or don't have that mindset that are like, no, I got to have two kids before 35. Right. So even though that's like, it's not my entire world, but it does always bring a little bit of fear. Cause I'm like, no, I know there's this other world that's possible. I know a lot of people, including yourself and your journey, who've had kids. And I love what you say. Like there are things that you can do to, where you can feel empowered and support yourself. And I'd actually love to hear about your story because there was a lot of twists and turns with your own fertility journey that I think we can get a lot out of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I, I hope I don't tear up. It's just like it was such an emotional time in my 30s. Um, and I probably still haven't processed it all. But, um, you know, it is a, a beautiful journey of just resiliency and the that desire to, to be a mom. Um, and I definitely had some of my closest friends say maybe it just wasn't meant to be that you should be a mom and just not accepting it. It's just like, there's, there's no way, but I come from, um, a family that's quite fertile. I'm one of 10 kids. And so I have, yeah, three sisters and six brothers. And so of course, you know, I was just like, of course I'm going to get pregnant easily. Like it wasn't even ever on my radar. Um, but we do talk a lot about the, the OBGYN quote unquote curse, just like, well, what, what issues are you going to have in the reproductive world just because you've decided to be an OBGYN? And so, uh, I got married when I was 29. And then when I turned 30, we started trying and, you know, I, we, I, it was six months and I started to do the, like the ovulation predictor kids, just checking. And then, you know, I checked in with my OBGYN at about month eight and she was just like, well, it hasn't been a whole year. So I would keep trying. And then after a year, you know, I called her up and she was just like, well, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll refer you to a fertility doctor. So we went to the fertility doctor and, you know, he ran all this testing and I was diagnosed with unexplained infertility, which is just like the worst thing that <laughs> that you can do, I feel like for a patient. Um, and I'm so glad that in the functional space, there's really no such thing as unexplained infertility. We can find something to to pinpoint and to and to make an actionable item from. But that's what I was diagnosed with. And I went on to do, uh, we probably did six rounds of artificial insemination, which didn't work. We took a lot of breaks in between. But again, like I said, I was so I was 31 when we started working with a fertility doctor. And um, at age 36 was the was the birth of my son. And I just remember in that time period, it, it, it was, it took so long. It felt like, you know, ages, but also looking back on it, you know, it it happened so fast and I didn't even get the opportunity to understand 
really what my body needed. And no one ever asked me, you know, what can, what, what could, or I'd never asked anybody, what can I do? You know, no one ever told me about changing my nutrition. I was doing uh, high intensity. I was a CrossFit scene. Um, no one ever said anything about those things. Um, and so we, from artificial insemination, we went to IVF and I was just a poor responder. Um, we took a break and we did um, surgery to check and see if I maybe had endometriosis. I did get diagnosed with endometriosis at that time and I had it all cleaned up, still did nothing really worked. And then um, I just, I remember this patient, I can see her face. And every time I saw her, cause she was pregnant. So I would see her regularly. Every time I saw her, she would say, you should really think about doing acupuncture. And I was just like, that's so goofy. Like, I'm not going to do acupuncture. I, I didn't, you know, when you're, when you're ignorant about something, it's really, really, really easy to dismiss it, which is, you know, why we have such a, a chasm between functional medicine and conventional medicine, because there are very few people who are willing to meet you in the middle and say, yeah, you know what? I don't know about those things, but let me learn. Um, and I'm so happy I'm in that in that middle space right now. But uh, I ended up saying, you know, what the heck? Let me just do it. I went to the acupuncturist. She looked at my tongue. She told me to stop doing CrossFit, and uh, I started getting acupuncture. That cycle, we were supposed to do IVF, and I only made one one follicle. And he said, well, I'm not going to go and retrieve that one follicle. We can switch it to artificial insemination. I said, well, that never works. You know, that didn't work before. What makes you think? He was like, it's something. I mean, we have it. You might as well try to use it. And that was the month we conceived with our son. And it Looking back on it now, I know that it was the acupuncture. Nothing else changed. And so that was mm. that was the start of my um, me being inquisitive about these alternative options that were out there. Um, a year later, we actually went back and we had two frozen embryos. My uh, doctor said that they weren't great quality. He thought we should just throw them both in and see what happens. And... <laughs> I went and did acupuncture with that cycle and they both took. Yeah. And so that was our twins. So I had, so Gideon our, is seven. I had him when I was 36 and then the twins, I had them when I was 38. And, um, and then I thought we were good. And then I turned 41 and we had actually had an adoption that with those five or so years working towards getting our first, we had went towards adoption. We got matched for an adoption. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started planning our nursery. We had his name picked out. And then the day that she delivered, our social worker called and said that she, and this is part that I get still, still choked up about, she, uh, she decided yeah. to keep the little baby boy. And so and then we went on to to get pregnant with Gideon. So we never really thought about it. But um, for some reason, we went back at 41. We used the same um, agency. Of course, there was fear that, you know, it wasn't going to work out again. But um, little baby Ella was born in April 2021. And we got to take her home. And it's just been like, I really, I mean, our family is complete and we have four beautiful children and I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, so, so much of my journey was me seeing other women have children, me delivering their babies and handing them off to them, me hearing them complain about the aches and pains of pregnancy. And I just remember feeling like if God had asked me, you know, Hey, I'll give you a baby, but you can never do your job again. I, I wouldn't accept it. I, I was, I have been so in love with my job and what I do. And I definitely feel like it's mm -hmm. a gift and talent and really as cliche as it sounds, I mean, like it all happened for a very real reason for me, because now these are the people that I advocate for. Wow. What an incredible story. Oh my gosh. I feel like so many women are going to listen to that and just feel like, 
inspired and all of the things. So kind of looking back on that journey, because my sister also, she definitely wouldn't mind me saying this, was having trouble in the beginning. Acupuncture changed everything for her. Um, I did acupuncture leading up to my pregnancy. Do you kind of feel like looking back, looking at the HIIT training, looking at everything, do you feel like there was a a component of your body maybe feeling a stress that you mentally didn't feel? 100%. 100%. Yes. How often do you think that cases of maybe this unexplained, I mean, even just looking at autoimmune conditions or like all of the things that women struggle with, how often are they like, hey, your body is stressed the F out. Mm -hmm. And that is what is being, that's the unexplained thing. So Mm -hmm. often, so often. I mean, I had, and you know, and, and I, I'm very thankful for, uh, for my conventional background because it's allowed me to, to, to have that, that trust that's been, that I've gained from my other providers in the community. They're like, oh, well, She's, she's not just some functional medicine doctor. She's an OBGYN. And so when mm-hmm. my patients, fertility doctors know that I'm, they're working with me, they're like, okay, yeah, whatever supplements that she puts you on, let's go ahead and do them. Where I know yeah. that there are patients who will come to see a functional medicine provider and then they'll go to see their their conventional OBGYN or their, or their fertility doctor and say, no, what are you doing? get off all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just about understanding that so much of you're creating, you're becoming a conduit for another human being. And so from top to bottom, head to toe, so much has to go right. And so us being able to access and explore things like oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction Mm -hmm. and mold toxicity and chronic infections as sources for infertility and saying, no, it's not just unexplained. You're not just crazy. You're not cursed. God doesn't have it out for you. Mm -hmm. God, I mean, that means so much for women. Absolutely. And you were talking about it before, and there's a place for functional medicine. There's a place for conventional medicine. And this beautiful middle ground of them coming together and saying like, hey, when do you need this? And when Mm -hmm. do you need this? But just looking back on your experience, what were some of the challenges for you when it came to women who were dealing with things like infertility, PCOS, hormonal imbalances that you would see in a conventional practice that maybe now on this more middle ground or the other side that you're on that you can look back and say, conventional medicine has this wrong? I fully accept that, you know, you can't, you know, you you can't plead ignorance to, you know, to being guilty. But, you know, unfortunately... Conventional OBGYNs are not trained in in this aspect. And so, yeah, I was treating symptoms. You know, you have polycystic ovary syndrome. Okay, well, you're having irregular periods. Let's put you on birth control. You're having acne. Let's put you on spironolactone or get you to a dermatologist to start Accutane. Uh, you know, you're having issues losing weight. You know, let's send you to a bariatric surgeon. It was it was all of these band-aids without actually, fe- without actually fixing the root cause. And so I fully accept responsibility that I do feel like, you know, and I was doing an injustice to those women. But about five years ago, I had found, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, It's founded by some amazing gurus. Um, Dr. Greger with um, nutritionfacts.org is one of the founders. Uh, But it's amazing. So my sister, who's also a doctor, we both got turned on to that. And so I started to talk to women with polycystic ovary syndrome, infertility, um, endometriosis, at at least about nutrition. I was addressing nutrition. And um, I ended up getting a dietitian for our practice. Um, But the crazy thing was that out of, I was one of five providers, no one else was using the dietitian, you know, and it was, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, there's a lot of barriers to doing things the right way. And I can confidently say like, this is the right way. Just like you said, there's a time and a place for functional and conventional. It really needs to start with functional first. And then if you can't, if, if again, 
meeting a patient where they're at if they just can't make changes and lifelong, you know, interventions for nutrition and sleep optimization and stress management, then to avoid anemia, put them on a birth control pill to avoid, you know, depression from how you look, put them on spironolactone. Um, but you've really got to work with so many aspects in, in a woman's lifestyle to really get that formula right. Oh, I'm sure so many people listening to this feel like they wish they had a doctor like you. I know. <laughs> Literally, when I met you, I was like, you're amazing. The fact that you're an OBGYN and you're bridging the gap between like conventional and functional, it's like, what can I love yeah. so much? Yeah. But yeah. I, uh, and yeah, I, I, you know, I feel I'm like, I feel like my patients too are, you know, so much of, you know, my family and my network. And, um, you know, I think like gone are the days, hopefully they're starting to get away where your doctor is, you know, is, is unreachable or untouchable or, you know, not uh, approachable. You know, I want all my patients to know, like, we should have that relationship where it's like, I know you very well. And if you need access to me, when you need access to me, then we're going to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, because it's such an intimate relationship. It really is. Absolutely. And Dr. Pear, I know you mentioned throughout this whole interview, a few of the more lifestyle nutritional practices that have changed your own fertility journey, as well as the patients you see. So maybe at a high level, you know, what are one to three things that you think can really make a difference if a woman listening today has your own journey of maybe having this quote unquote unexplained fertility. I mean, nutrition, yes, is huge. I will tell you for, for my journey, I ended up going, um, completely plant based. That was actually after I had had kids. Um, but for my endometriosis symptom control, it has been a game changer. And, um, you know, I love, also, I happen to love animals, you know, but I'm not opposed to, I'm not, you know, I'm not strict vegan, um, but being predominantly plant-based has changed my life. Um, and so I do, I do put that on my blog. That's, you know, for my, um, for my, I'm trying to think of what you say, like the, the little intro in my website, I put that, you know, I'm plant based. So I think a lot of people get scared when they're coming to me because they're like, Oh my gosh, you're gonna make me stop eating meat. Um, but to, to each individual, we can work within the confines of where you where you want to be what you're comfortable with. Um, but nutrition has got to change. We really are what we what we put in our bodies mm -hmm. is what we're going to expect to come out. So you cannot expect to put inflammatory foods in and get those same results. Um, but a lot of people don't even know realize like what inflammatory foods are and what they can do to your body, you know? Um, so ed educating is like mind blowing for most patients. And then it becomes really frictionless mm -hmm. when you know the whys behind the recommendations. Um, so that's one saying no, like, Saying no is huge, right? Reducing your stress by taking things off your plate, okay? Yeah. Saying no in so many aspects of your life. But also, again, you know, saying no to things that aren't going to feed your nutrition, so bad foods. Um, saying no to, you know, frequent alcohol use. That's really, really a big one that is just so undervalued in how much it can change women, their hormones. Um and then, um, did I say sleep? Sleep. No, yes. No, sleep no, is yet. a huge one too. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, if, if you're not letting your body rest and recharge, then what expectations can you have for it? So, so what do you think it was specifically about going plant-based that helped with the endometriosis? Because we have a lot of people who come to us asking specifically about endometriosis. Do you think it was the anti-inflammatory Absolutely. Effect. Absolutely. I think it I think it was just putting honestly, I think it was just putting more vegetables on my plate, you know? Not even realizing that, mm. you know, it, it's it's great to have 7 to 12 servings of vegetables, but how many are we actually getting in a in a day if we're not plant predominant? One, maybe two. And so it was just about, you know, crowding out my plate with with vegetables and 
you know, now occasionally I'll save some room for, you know, a fish or something like that. Um, I still don't eat red meat. Um, I just, I don't have a taste for it anymore. And I know that, you know, studies have shown that it's highly inflammatory for endometriosis patients. Um, and then, you know, dairy is one of those things that, oh my God, there's no good non-dairy cheese out there. Can we just like admit that? Like, I mean, I want I want to invent a good non-dairy cheese. <laughs> so true. And they always have like right? they're so processed. Like, okay. So um, you know, again, it's you know, it's kind of an 80-20 thing that you should have with so many aspects of your life. But you know, 80% of the time, if you're eating plant-based, if you're trying to reduce inflammatory foods, and the other 20% you're enjoying, you know, company with, you know good food and alcohol, then, you know, that's, that's really the balance. So one of the other questions that we get common uh, to be a, one of the common questions that we get is if somebody's experiencing chronic things like BV, yeast infections and UTIs, you know, if they go to their OBGYN, they're often given antibiotics, antifungals, prescription, whatever it is sent on their way. But functional medicine has a kind of different approach to these issues that are more chronic. What is your advice for someone who's dealing with these types of issues? Yes. So recurrent BV, yeast, and UTIs, uh, you know, there's just really great information and evidence about biofilms, especially for UTIs, but we're starting to see that that's the case for BV and yeast infections as well. So these little domes that bacteria create to to hide and to not be able to be accessed by antibiotics. So uncovering those, giving patients things that are going to help with uh, biofilm, disrupting those, um, and then overcrowding your bad bacteria that's causing symptoms um, with the good bacteria, knowing that there's that balance in your, just like in your GI tract, there's that balance in your bladder and in your vagina for wanting that um, symbiotic relationship with good bacteria. And so really talking to patients about uh, what, what, bri what probiotics are going to work best for them and um, how to get mm -hmm. good bacteria, the food for good bacteria, fiber-rich foods um, in their diets. And also, I'd love to get your thoughts. We get this question as well from our BIA community. What are your thoughts on hormone replacement yes, therapy? Yes, great question. Yeah, we get we get that a lot too. Um, you know, in the in the functional space, we have a lot of patients that actually will come to come to me because they don't want to be on hormone replacement therapy. Um, but again, mm -hmm. it's about educating patients and knowing that um, you know the risks that are associated with synthetic hormones, like you know the breast cancer risk and the clotting risk, the stroke risk are all very scary. Um, but when we talk about bioidentical compounded estrogens, progesterones, testosterones, the data is not there to show that those are risks with bioidenticals. And so that's something refreshing and beautiful to think that mm -hmm. there are options that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to be uncomfortable and um, have low libido and things like that. Um, because unfortunately, I haven't seen a whole lot um, be as powerful in the way of supplements as bioidentical hormones are for a lot of those symptoms. So, and you know, one thing that I uh, kind of switching topics, one thing that I didn't know too much about, as much as I did know before about things like diabetes and hypertension, I just didn't know about gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension, which are very real things. And quickly, when you become pregnant and you're educated about this stuff, it just becomes a reality like this could happen. And so if somebody is struggling right now with something like gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, what's your advice to them? Right. Uh, yes. So those are some of the my, my favorite things that I like educating patients about because, again, I think those are two aspects, especially preeclampsia, where women feel so 
unable to do anything themselves about it. But for ge- for gestational diabetes, well, one, again, before, before you conceive, knowing if you have risk factors for that. So we know women with polycystic ovary syndrome. So a lot of your customers that love everything about seed cycling with BIA have PCOS and they're at risk of developing gestational diabetes. So um, being on, so a great supplement is the myoinositol d Cairo. Um, inositol is something that they can continue through pregnancy and that can help to reduce their baseline um, blood sugar readings and help reduce their risk of um, gestation, gestational diabetes. Even if they're not on it and they get diagnosed with it, when uh, when we see pregnant women, we have them see a dietitian and we start them on inositol before we do anything like insulin so or metformin. Some people will do metformin for uh, gestational diabetes, but we've seen Great results with inositol um, and just monitoring blood sugar levels for preventing the need for some harsh prescriptions for gestational diabetes. And then uh, preeclampsia, you know, um, just a, a potentially very devastating diagnosis. It can increase the risk of um, both baby and maternal um outcomes, morbidity, as well as mortality. And, um, you know, I recently saw a patient who lost um, a 23-weeker. Um, he had to be delivered because she ended up developing preeclampsia. And of course, you know, she, hindsight is always twenty twenty. She said, you know, she felt like she was developing puffiness. Her doctor said that that was normal. Um, she wasn't feeling good. Her doctor said that was normal. And then she went in, her blood pressure was really high. Um, we ended up, you know, we, we talked her through just all of the things that she can do differently next pregnancy to reduce her risk. Um, Calcium supplementation has been shown to help to reduce the risk of preeclampsia. Um, I usually tell patients 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, do it, checking, so uh, adiponectin to leptin ratios have been associated with, um, so low ratios have been associated with that risk for preeclampsia, and so her ratio was low. So working towards correcting that, um, you know, um, getting to, you know, even just a 5% weight loss can reduce her risk of recurrence and um, really knowing the warning signs as well. Um, And then uh, anti-inflammatory foods, of course, are huge for helping to reduce that. So what some of the things that I think a lot of people are like, either I can't do anything about it, or my doctor said to do low salt intake, and neither one of those is true. So yeah. And all of my patients that have done those interventions prior to conceiving again have not had preeclampsia again. Wow, that's amazing. And I have a silly question. I mean, I hear preeclampsia all the time, but what is really going on? And you mentioned with your patient that her doctor just kind of thought her feeling bad or puffy was part of pregnancy. I feel like so many people can easily kind of fall into that because you're feeling so many different things. So what is preeclampsia for people like me who might not know? And what are some things that um, can really help you identify if you might have it being pregnant. Absolutely, yes. So preeclampsia is so gestational hypertension is when you have elevated blood pressure in pregnancy without other findings on uh, okay. labs, lab results, or the baby's ultrasound. So when it gets when it progresses to preeclampsia, you've either got um, elevated liver function test or you've got uh, kidney dysfunction, so an elevated creatinine level. Uh, you, we may see um, a significant drop in your blood count as well as your platelet count. And then findings for the baby is that they can, um, from one ultrasound to the next, they can they can have poor growth, so they're not growing as much as we would expect, or they actually have lost weight, uh, which is really concerning. And then um, looking at umbilical cord flow, um, and for preeclamptic patients, um, that flow to the baby is actually being reversed. So it's going away from the baby. And, you know, it's a lot of the etiology around why preeclampsia happens is uh, placental dysfunction. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, just that realization that, you know, for some women, um, that that immune and that inflammatory response that's really supposed to be subdued in pregnancy is 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 triggered. And so it's almost like a reaction to the placenta. Um, your body no longer wants that placenta there. And so it starts to do things to 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 remove it. So 
Yeah. So in that, in those cases, when it escalates to um, liver function tests that are that are really high, very low platelet levels, um, baby is not growing. Um, those are indications to deliver the baby um, to cure the preeclampsia before there's some serious um, consequences. And unfortunately for my patient, you know, uh, 23 weeks, the, the baby was just too small for um, compatibility with life. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But you know, yeah, but you know, and, and you talk about, you know, swelling. Um, yeah, that's a common women have intuition. So when I have a patient that is a mm -hmm. new mom and she knows that swelling is supposed to be normal, but she's calling me after hours for the swelling. I know that she knows that there's something else going on and she can't quite articulate what she's sensing. Um, and so those are times where you say, you know, I'm going to have this patient come in and I'm going to take a closer look and I'm going to help ease. Hopefully it's just anxieties about that. Um, but most of the time it's not. Women yeah. really do know their bodies. Totally. I love that. Yeah. And I love that there's so much like – for example, when I said going into pregnancy, I didn't know, but like, I love the education and awareness around it because like you said, there's so much that can be done prior to getting pregnant to help prevent some of these more serious issues. And unfortunately, not a lot of women know about it, but I hope that they listen to conversations like this because mm -hmm. like you said, it can be prevented. And it's amazing that your patients didn't have to go through that again because it's so Exactly, traumatic. exactly. And I will tell you two two other things. So I mean, one, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends women that have that are either over age 35 um, or have two risk factors for preeclampsia, which is, you know, a certain BMI, family history of high blood pressure, a personal history of high blood pressure, they recommend a baby aspirin be started at a certain weeks in pregnancy. And I will tell you, you know, that this should be common knowledge for a lot of OBGYNs, but this patient was not on it. She had two risk factors. She was 35. She, you know, her BMI was not in the, in the ideal range. And so she should have been started on that. So, um, you know, that is why I do love these platforms because even things that should be common knowledge, um, they're not. And so patients really do have to, I, I told her, I was just like, you know, from this point forward, you're never going to trust another doctor, nor should you. Okay. Don't trust me. You know, I'm giving you all of the information that you need, but yeah. I want you to scour, you know, every source that you can and get all of the information as well as yourself. And every time you see me, you're asking question after question after question so that you feel comfortable. A hundred percent. Yeah. I love that. Making them feel empowered. And I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit because this is a question that I'm very passionate about just from my own experience. But I'd love to get your perspective around maybe the downsides of birth control and things like a copper yeah, IUD. Yeah. So this was eye opening for me when I got into the functional medicine space. You know, um, I, I always tell patients, oh, if you're not having a period on birth control, it's fine. That's great. You know, I mean, who wants, who wants, <laughs> who wants, who wants that a was period? Me, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, that, that so many things I love about functional medicine, but, um, learning to love your cycle, it has got to be like in my top three things of why I love doing functional medicine, women's health, because we get so, we, we get taught like, oh, it's annoying. It's a burden, you know? Um, well, I want to swim. I want to like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I can't do it because I'm on my effing period, you know? But just that realization that your, your body yeah. is doing something every day of that 28 day cycle. Um, and that it's actually working towards, um, a really, um, a, a really important purpose for you in your day to day. It's just so I love the science about, behind exercise and and cycles and cycle syncing. Period. You know, I mean, what you guys are doing with B and C cycling, um, and just seeing the beauty and how that works for women. But um, so birth control is something that I really do not think that I gave informed decision making to patients about. Um, and then just seeing that the science and the evidence, well, I mean, it's, it's all there. It's in that 20 page, like Santa's list, you know, package insert, you know, that nobody reads, um, not even the doctors, but we know the majority of the time, you know, it's not going to 
significantly harm anyone. Um, and so you need, you don't want to get pregnant. So of course, let's get you started on some birth control. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how, you know, I'm always willing to meet patients where they're at. And so if you, if you don't trust fertility awareness method, despite me educating you about it, um, then we can talk about birth control options, but you're going to go in fully aware and do things that are going to mitigate your risk when you do come off of it. So, I mean, we know that birth control pills deplete you of magnesium, selenium, your B vitamins. Um, they, they, they cause iron storage for some women that, you know, can't really process iron really well. So I actually, you know, I had, um, I took care of a, an infertility patient recently. Um, who had been on birth control pills. Part of our functional comprehensive panel when we see a first-time patient is checking iron levels. Iron levels were through the roof. Um, she had high ferritin levels and we diagnosed her with hemochromatosis. Um, we were able to get her iron levels down. Um, she went from an AMH of 0 0.3 to 1.7 and she was able to retrieve embryos. And so, yeah, so just, just having wow. that understanding, okay, if you're going to be on birth control pills long term, we should check these levels. We should get you on these supplements. Um, and we should really think about checking in more often than just a year just to see how you're doing with your symptoms and what how your body's reacting to it. Um, when it comes to the copper IUD, there's obviously a lot of uh, advantages to it because it has no hormones. And so the thought is that it doesn't impact your hormones. But as we're seeing with more evidence that's emerging is that, you know, it's a foreign body. So, you know, a foreign body is going to cause a, mm -hmm. an inflammatory state regardless of how inflamed you feel externally. That's what's happening in your uterus. And we know that we're having disruptions in the endometrial microbiome. And that, that reaction to that inflammatory state is for your estrogen to become imbalanced as a result of just how your body reacts to inflammation, period. So we're seeing hormonal changes. And so for a lot of women that used to come in and say, well, I'm having low libido, I'm, I'm really irritable with the with the copper IUD and I don't know what's going on because it doesn't have any hormones in it. You know, it's, it's wise to, to, to heed again, their, their intuitions and think about, you know, removing that IUT. So, um, we also know that five to 10% of women with IUDs, when they have them removed, have difficulty getting pregnant and we don't know quite why. So it, that's an important yeah. thing to talk to patients about. Hey, if you're thinking about getting pregnant within the year, you know, this may not be the best option for you or how do we support your fertility in other ways? Gosh. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's just giving them all the information that's available exactly. so they can make the best decision for them, which is mm -hmm. what you mentioned a lot of doctors are not doing. It's like, hey, this is safe for most people. Mm -hmm. There's all this, there's all these words on this exactly. document and warnings, but forget about that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I know we're kind of coming up a little bit on time. So I want to hear your maybe like top three to five tips for taking care of our hormones and our reproductive health daily. What are some things that maybe you implement or you recommend that women implement to just, I mean, gut gets so much love, you know, ever all parts of the body get so much love, but our hormones get no love. So what are some of the things <laughs> that you recommend that we do daily to kind of take care of our hormones? Oh, yeah. So I, I think number one is, um, is taking the time for yourself, you know, um, even five minutes, 10 minutes to actually take time to care and love for yourself. And, and, and that may be like, you know, you, you have a, a makeup routine ritual, like that's, that's for me. Like I love makeup. I love doing my makeup. I feel, you know, so much more confident when I do my makeup. And so I wake up in the morning, you know, I wake up at four o'clock every morning because I, 
you know, that's the only time that I'm going to get quietness with four kids in the house. But, you know, I think that that's so important, having a ritual for self-care. Um, number two is, yeah, I mean, you know, gut health gets talked about a lot because it's important for so many aspects of our lives and reproductive health um, is is definitely one of those. So um, feeding your body fiber-rich foods, um, making sure that you're doing whole foods, um, minimally process, um, you know, not, not feeding into the caffeine in the morning and the alcohol at night cycle. Um, that is such in, in theory, a simple thing for, for me to recommend for patients, but really hard to do, especially when you're in that cycle, you're like, well, I need my caffeine to rev me up. I need my alcohol to wind me down. Um, but starting to slowly break that cycle, you will see so much benefit with your for your reproductive hormones, a hundred percent. And then again, you know, I can't stress, you know, sleep. You know, we need our circadian rhythm um, to help regulate uh, our adrenals, which trickles down to our thyroids, which trick- which trickles down to our sex hormones. So. Absolutely. I love. So wait, Roxanne, when do you go to sleep if you wake up at four? That's the only thing I was thinking about. I was like, I wait, sleep at nine o'clock. when do you sleep? 9.30 at the <laughs> latest. So yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm out. I tell my husband, you better get in You're there out. now because okay. I'm about to be out. That's, yeah. That's yeah. good. So he's a night owl. So I know that that is me. But what I've realized, I never thought I was a morning person. But ever since I met Drew, I've been sleeping earlier and I've become yeah. this morning person just because I'm sleeping earlier. So it really could be game changing. So I love to just kind of hear how you set up your life um, because it's nice. I mean, I don't have kids, but like to have that time to yourself is so valuable. And yes. whether that's maybe after they sleep or in the mornings, if you can set it up yeah. the way you did, that's yeah. really cool. It makes um, a lot of sense to me. But no, this was so amazing. What I just, you know, I'm so, I love this conversation. I feel like we need to do a part two and three, but the biggest takeaways from everything that you're saying is like, there's so much in our power to support our bodies. And it's like putting the education out there because even for me, you know, I go to an acupuncturist. I was doing everything we talked about in the wrong ways. I was on birth control. I lived a super high stress lifestyle. I thought I was healthy, but I was doing hit all the time, even when I was on my period. And luckily, you know, my own functional medicine journey came about, you know, two and a half years ago. We launched BIA during that process when I got exposed to this world. And my acupuncturist, every time she sees me, she's like, I am just so surprised by your labs because the way your old life was, I've never seen anything like this. And it's just a testament to taking care of yourself, doing everything we're talking about. And there's so much in your power, which I wish I knew that earlier on. So I'm just so passionate about everything you're bringing and educating about. And I can't wait. We'll share your podcast and where everybody can find you, Dr. Pero. But this was awesome. Thank Thank you. you Yeah. Thank y'all for having me. It's been a great, it's been a pleasure. Thank y'all. Thank you so much. (laughs)